Okay, so um, welcome. This is Media Data Formats, not PHP. Uh, so I'll talk you through the module there very briefly. Um, you can see there from the assessment, which is something people are always interested in, that 20% um, coursework and then 80% exam at the end of the semester. Questions. Um, I can show you some. I can show you some past papers. So that's probably as high as you get for a final paper at CIT, really. So it's twenty percent continuous assessment, eighty percent exam at the end. Okay. What's this module about? Well, it's basically about how you turn bits into media. So you're familiar with the fact that computers store information in bits, but how does a bunch of bits become text? So you, you might speculate that if you could open up a text file and see the bits, you might see ASCII. You might see bits that represent ASCII values. But if you opened up a JPEG, what would the, the bits mean? If you opened up a uh, GIF, what might the, the bits be doing? So this module is how you go from bits, basically, to, to Beethoven, how you'd go from bits to, you know, Breaking Bad. How, how, how do you use bits to represent those kinds of information? Okay, so that's basically the, the gist of the module. Um, in terms of the timetable, it specifies two lectures, one lab, and one tutorial. What I propose to do is to have lectures when we have stuff to talk about. When we have done enough, it'll make sense to have labs. And I might leave the bulk of the tutorials until the end. So I'd expect you initially to go to the four classes a week. And then um, some days I might let you know in advance today's only going to be a tutorial or whatever. So there'll be nothing new covered at the tutorial. We just, you know, regroup and, and consolidate. And then obviously just before the exam, that would be a really good time to have tutorials rather than labs and lectures. So, in total, I expect that you will have, what, 2 by 12, so you'll have 24 lectures, you'll have 12 labs and 12 tutorials, but you might not have a tutorial for a while. You might not have a lab for a while. So, for now anyway, it's the four hours a week um, of lectures, I suppose, initially. Okay? So... Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. I'll give. I'll email you that. Okay. I'll give it a sec. Okay. So, and um, you have to excuse now my distraction there, but I, the the machine I have isn't the cable I have is too short to reach the table, so I have to look away. Okay. So, we all know what a bit is. So computers store information in bits, and the bits can either be a zero or a one. Now that's just a convention. We, we choose to, um, to represent them using 0 and 1. But actually there's, you know, you could, there's, there's nothing sacred about that. I mean, a bit is basically something that has two states. So um, a light bulb could be on or it could be off. And with those two, with one bit, we can represent those two possible states. We might say a zero means that the light bulb is off, and then one means that it's on. Or we could say zero means that it's on, and one means that it's off. It's totally arbitrary. But with one bit, we can represent two possible scenarios. Okay. 
the meaning of the one and the zero is up to us. So like if you, if you have some sort of a system, there's a bit that tells you whether the light is on or off and you look at it and it says one, well that doesn't tell you anything. You have to know that one means on and zero means off in this situation or the other way around. So the bits by themselves don't mean anything. It's up to us to, to give them meaning, to interpret them. So, um, you know, you see in all these, these movies, the college dorm, um, sock on the door means something. No sock on the door means, you know, safe to come in, whatever. Okay? The meaning of the bit is, is not inherent in, in the bit itself. It's up to us to give it the meaning. Similarly, you know, here the light could be on, could be off. In this case, if the red light is on, it means don't come in. If the DJ is on air. If the light's off, it means you can come in. Thumbs up could be one thing, thumbs down, something else. A bit could mean, you know, zero means happy, one means sad, or, you know, one means happy and zero means sad. It's up to you. The interesting question then is how many bits would you need to describe the state of a traffic light? So traffic light could be red, amber, or green. No, I think in some countries, basically, um, traffic lights are either go or stop. Do you know? So in French, it's a feu rouge. It's a red light. If it's not red, flake away. Right? But here, we've red, amber, and green. So it has three possible states. So with just one bit, you don't have enough to represent three possible states. So we need two bits. So we could say, for example, um, zero, zero means red, zero, one means amber, and one, zero means green, for example. You could do it any way we like. So if you had, um, if you had some system that had, you know, you had like all these bits here in front of you and they represented the, the traffic lights around town, you, you'd need two bits for each light. And then you could see, depending on whether it was 0, 0, 0, 1, or 1, 0, what state it was at. Now, the mapping of the bits to the lights is completely arbitrary. And one system is as good as the next. And so how we interpret the bits then is typically described in what we'd call a table. So we might say, OK, so 0, 0 doesn't mean anything. 0, 1 means green. 1, 0 means amber, and 1, 1 means red, for example. But it's totally makey uppy. It could be that way. Without the table, without the mapping of the bits to the meaning, you've no meaning, you're just bits. Bits by themselves don't mean anything. So some people tell you, you know, 0 means off and 1 means on. Well, no, that's just, you know, one convention. Bits by themselves don't mean anything, and we have to, outside of the bits, assign meaning to them. This way, just as, just as good, or just as bad. So with two bits, we could represent four possible combinations, or four possible states. Because we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. <coughs> How many bits would you need to give each student in a class their own unique code? Well, in today's class, we only need two bits. So you could be student 0, 0, you could be 0, 1, you could be 1, 0, and you could be 1, 1. In general, though, it's going to depend on how many people are in the class. So if you have a class with hundreds of students, you'll need more bits. How many bits would you need if you had 20 students in the class? How many bits would you need to give each one their own unique code? 5%. I think so. I think it's 5. 
Okay, whoops, can I go back? I can't. So, if you had four bits, right, you could represent 16 possible different scenarios. So if you had four bits, you could have 16 students each having a unique code. But if you have 20 students, you don't have enough, you run out. There's no combination of ones and zeros that I could use for Ryan. It hasn't already been used by someone else. So you're right, you need five bits. So with five bits then, what do I have to do to make this go? With five bits, you've enough then for 20 students. Get the idea? In general then, with n bits, you can represent 2 to the power of n different things. So with 1 bit, you can represent 2 things, 2 bits, 4 things, 3 bits, 8 things, 4 bits, 16 things, 5 bits, 32 possible situations or possible separate things, and so on. Which is why in computing we often see num numbers like 256 and 128 turn up a lot. Because you can represent those with a certain number of bits. So how many bits would you need to give each student in a class of 25 a unique code? So five, you needed five bits when you had 20 students. You had 25 students, how many did you need? Twenty-five students. So five again. What about if you had forty students in the class? Eight bits would give you how many? Eight bits would allow you to do two hundred and fifty-six. So that's overkill. Seven bits would allow you one hundred and twenty-eight. Six bits would allow you sixty-four but five bits would only allow you 32. So five bits isn't enough. So you'd need six, yeah? To represent a day of the week, there's seven days of the week, how many bits? Three, yeah. And to represent a day of the month? Five. Four bits, you could have 16. Five bits, 32. And 32 is plenty. There's no month with more than 32 days. Now, computer memory then is organized into groups of eight bits called bytes. So eight bits is one byte. 16 bits is two bytes. 32 bits is four bytes. Sometimes people talk about a nibble, that's four bits. I remember there was a who wants to be a millionaire question once where they said which of these is a computing term and they bytes and nibbles, but actually nibble is a computing term too. I think it's four bits, but we don't, we don't talk about them anymore. So the bytes then are broken up into kilobytes and a kilobyte is, is 1,024 bytes. So a kilometer is a thousand meters, but a kilobyte is a thousand and twenty-four bytes. So if you divide the number of bytes by a thousand, you only get a rough approximation of the number of kilobytes. So to, do, to get the proper answer, you'd have to divide by a thousand and twenty-four. So 2048 bytes is 2 kilobytes. You have to be careful as well because sometimes people are talking about kilobytes and sometimes they're talking about kilobits and megabits, like your broadband. I think that's not measured in megabytes. I think it's measured in megabits, which is, you know, eight times slower than you might think. Okay. 
So how many possible things could we represent then with one byte, which is eight bits? Two to the power of eight. So if you, if you can, you can do it. You can go like two, double every time. Two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, hundred twenty-eight, and then two hundred fifty-six for eight bits. So two hundred fifty-six possible combinations of ones and zeros. Two hundred fifty-six possible things you can represent. How many things could you represent with two bytes at 16 bits? I turned off my calculator there now, so. <laughs> anyway, it's two to the power of 16, which is 256 multiplied by 256, which is six, at 64,000 and something, I think, or 65,000 and something. And with three bits then, you've got Sorry, with three bytes, you've got 24 bits, which is 16 million whatever. Sometimes um, you might see a graphics card talking about 24-bit um, graphics. Because the thing can have 16 million colors. Okay. Now, a sequence of bits then all by itself doesn't mean anything. It's just a bunch of bits. The meaning of those bits is assigned by us. The computer only stores ones and zeros, okay? So um, a bunch of ones and zeros, that's a GIF, a bunch of ones and zeros, that's a JPEG, and a bunch of ones and zeros, that's a music file. You know, they're just ones and zeros. It's something external to them that makes them what they are, okay? So the meaning comes from our in interpretation of the, of the sequence of bits. So we've different systems then developed for text and for images and for music and for video and for graphics files and for architectural drawings and, you know, faxes and ringtones and MIDI files and all of these things. They're all just sequences of bits, but we've developed then over time um, systems that give these sequences of bits meaning. For example, very often the first few bytes of a file tell you what kind of file it is. It says, hey, I'm a JPEG, or hey, I'm a GIF. Um, you know, okay? So what this module is about then is those systems. So how do we, from our building blocks of bits, make an image? How do, we, how do we go about that? From our building blocks of bits, how do we make an ebook or a text file? How, how do we go about that? And that's, that's, in essence, what this module is about. So, first thing we're going to look at then is how we might represent numbers. How might we represent an integer? So you might have come across some of this in your architecture class. How do you represent numbers in a computer system? So one thing we do is we have a scheme that's very like our digital writing system where we write down numbers, where we have um, the least significant value at the right and the most important one on the left. And so we have a, a bunch of bits the last bit is worth one, and then the next bit is worth two, and the next bit is worth four, and the next bit is worth eight, and so on. And so each bit corresponds to a particular value. So if we have one zero one zero zero one, the first one there, in the most significant bit, that's worth 32. So if there's a 1 in there, there's 32 in our, in our total. The 0 there means it's 16. Next to 16 means the, the, six, the bit that's worth 16 isn't used. The next one there, the bit that's worth 8, 
has got a 1 in it, so we add 8 to our total, so now we're up to 40. The bit that's worth 4 has a 0 in it. The bit that worth, that's worth 2 has a 0 in it. The bit that's worth 1 has a 1 in it, so now we've got 32 plus 8 plus 1, which gives us what? 41. So in this system here, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 is worth 41. Okay. Here, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0 is 16 plus 4 plus 2. This gives us 22. So if we need a computer system, a binary system that stored integers, we could use something like this. What about 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 gives us 63. So with 6 bits, 2 to the power of 6 is 64. So we can represent 64 possible values. In this scheme, the largest number we can represent is 63. And we're out by 1 because 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 would represent 0. So if you 64 possible values, you can go from 0 to 63. Okay. You can extend this system then by just having more bits. So with 8 bits, you can represent all the values from 0 to 255, and so on. So in some programming languages, for example, um, you might be told that a particular type can only be from 0 to 255. And that's because one byte is being used to, to represent those kind of values. So, what's 0, 1, 0, 0, 0? So the first one is worth 32. So 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. So 16. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1? 33. Yeah. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1? 1. 0, 1, 0, 1, 0? Yeah. So 16 and 2. 1, 0, 0, 1, 0? 34, because 32 and 2. The first one is worth 32. Okay. So we might um, we might come back to that. So a byte can represent all the values then from 0 to 255. Okay. And you can see how um, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, add those all up, and you get 255. Now, how then might we represent negative numbers? Let's say we needed to represent integers, but they could be negative. Well, one scheme would be to have sign and magnitude. So we'd use a bit to say whether the number is positive or negative. So you could say where we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 bits, we'll use 5 bits for the number part, and then the first bit will tell us the sign. So we might say 0 for negative and 1 for positive. Or we could do it the other way around. We could say 0 is positive and 1 is negative, whatever. One system is as good as the next. And you could see how 
how that could work. That, that could be fine. Okay, so here, um, in this scheme, we're saying zero is, what did we say? Zero is positive and one is negative. So here we have zero, which tells us whether it's positive or negative. In this case, positive. So then the number part is zero, one, zero, one, zero. So that would be 10 by itself. With the sign, it's positive 10, plus 10. Here, we have the, the magnitude part is once again 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, which is 10. And then the sign is negative in this case. So this would be equal to minus 10. So that's another system. Here, um, the sign here, 0 again. So it tells us it's a positive number. And in this case, 11010 is 16 plus 8 plus 2 is 26. So it's plus 26, positive 26. So here we're using one of the bits to tell us whether the number is negative or positive. And then the rest of it then is the same as, as we're used to. Here, um, 111010 is minus 26 or negative 26 because that first bit tells us whether it's positive or negative no so zero 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 so the numeric part here is zero the magnitude part is zero and then the sign is zero so that tells us it's positive zero okay fair enough if we switch that then to one zero 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 we get minus zero which is zero so one of the problems with this scheme I mean it works fine and it's simple to understand and it's handy and easy but you've two ways of representing the same number one zero 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 means zero and zero 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 means zero that's not that's that's not ideal there are two ways now of representing the same thing i mean if you could imagine if you had a program that was saying you know if a equals b then do whatever and if a was represented as one zero 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 and b was zero 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 at the low level the code might have said well those are clearly two different numbers but actually a is zero and b is zero so the test might fail when it should pass and your program might not work properly so that's an example of when it might all go all go wrong so it's it's not ideal so sine and magnitude is easy to understand it's easy to implement you've got two bit sequences for zero it's not not great and it's not very useful and I'll show you what what that means okay so in the next class we're going to look at a thing called one's complement and this is another system for representing integers with a sign. So positive and negative integers. And once again, it still needs an extra bit so that you can tell whether something is positive or negative. This system is a bit more complex, but it's a bit more useful. So that's what we look at in, in the next class. Any questions on any of that?